John Wesley Hicks, welcome to the Cadillac on? Podcast. Thank you, you so man? much. Doing great, doing great. I'm still trying to recover from seeing your <laughs> earlier today in that. <laughs> <tank battle. laughs> Guys, my trauma, my trauma is real. Guys, my trauma is real. Seeing <laughs> oh, you, you're not ready for that experience. Just let's keep the uh, Metallica you know, t-shirt on. You know, I'm going to edit all of this, right? <laughs> Why? <laughs> don't edit it. <laughs> don't, get, don't, get, don't get embarrassed. <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's great. I don't know if I should edit it or if I should just start over. Just um, let them let let them see the real reality of what what we're dealing with. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do? We just give the people what they want. All right, but just so you know, this is supposed to be a professional podcast. It's not fully no, professional. I put on Adidas. I put on my best Adidas dry fit shirt today for your podcast. So, Thank so you so what, much. Of course, of course. <laughs> only you deserve the best. Do the introduction, uh, and then you you fill up the introduction if uh, there's anything I didn't get. Although I don't have a lot to say about you. Uh, what you're did you have a lot to say about me? I mean, I, I know a lot, but I also... Been... What are you, 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 I feel like you're holding out on me. I put on my best dry fit Adidas t-shirt for you for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a lot to say about me? All right. You guys, you, need you to be guys. Serious like, he's, now. He's, short, he's, he's, he's short-sighted me. Don't, don't let him fool you. <laughs> So, Johnny Hicks, John John Wesley Hicks, an HR executive for, uh, um, do we say that we get, we're not going to say uh, the name of the company, but you work for a tech company in the Bay Area. Uh, and what else do we say? You're single and loving it. I mean, he wanted me to talk You're... about being single, you guys, like. You know, it's there's there's good parts and bad parts. You know, you know, oh, it's, a, it's it. a struggle out here. I'm stopping it. <laughs> and I don't know how much I'm gonna chop off that intro. It will probably be at thirty seconds. Let's go again. So, he was, my... trying to like clean, he was trying to clean it up for you guys, but we're, we're gonna keep the we're gonna keep the intro <laughs> clean this time. He was trying to be clean. So, okay, so I'll be proper. How would you like me to be proper? <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Serious now. Yeah, go for it. Like, what do you want to talk about? So, so Devin, let's start with the introduction. Uh, John mm -hmm. Wesley Hicks, an HR executive. Um, and then you work for a tech company in the Bay Area. So and like I don't that. have anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have anything else. I have your single and you're liking it. Your what's important for you is being single, being happy, and being rich. Again, I don't know if this is the right introduction, um, but what would you want to say? Like, if I ask you to introduce yourself, how would you introduce yourself? Well, how would I introduce myself? I would say I really love Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. I love eating pancakes. Banana pancakes are amazing. Uh, and, and, and I would say that, you know, I try to make money when I can. You know, you know, it's, it's expensive out here in these streets. So yeah. I, I try to make it. So that's my story. I'm I'm just a regular guy trying to survive. Okay. I mean, so this is I, mean a really I don't have hair. I don't have hair like Muhammad, so you know I have to do what I can. I grow hair here. <laughs> he grows hair in other places. You know we do what we can. And so this is probably a good a good place to to start the conversation because you wouldn't introduce yourself in terms of what you're doing and what your job is, uh, which is normally a lot of people would do that. Like if, if I of introduce myself would. and someone tell me, hmm. yeah, and. If I introduce myself, I will say, hey, I'm an HR consultant or I'm a talent mm -hmm. management consultant. Mm -hmm. But instead mm -hmm. of that, and, and for you, you don't say that. No, of course not, because that's not who you were you were born to be, right? So, like, those, those career uh, aspects or those career attributes of yourself are constructs, right? Those are uh -huh. man-made. So, like, if we go back into the 17, 1800s, you know, everybody was like 
stanking a little bit, wearing different clothes, different music. Did an HR consultant exist? Um, no. Did, did all the careers that exist today, like a social media expert. So my sister, who I love dearly, is a social media um, like expert manager for a tech company. That didn't exist mm-hmm. years ago. I don't know how 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 it magically came about, but those careers exist. So I, I like to focus in on like who I am as a person um, first, yeah. because I think who I am as a person is more important than than the attributes and the accolades in my LinkedIn profile. So so who are you as a person and who am I as a person, I think is really important. Um, and I think it's important to get to know people um, as human beings first. And then if you want to know how I make my money, then we can talk. But first of all, like, I would appreciate, you know, understanding, like, who, who, I, who am I as a person? What type of music do I listen to? Who, who do I love and care for? What type of uh, hair envy do I have for my friend Muhammad here that I don't have? Those things are important. Who you are as a human being is more important than your career. And trust me, as an HR professional, I've taken careers away from some of the highest level executives in the world. And trust me, yeah. their identities are much deeper and should be deeper than their actual titles and careers. So, so yeah. So, so like if amongst the top leaders, HR executives, whatever, you know, the, the, the top levels of organizations, do they have mm-hmm. the same, do they describe themselves the same way that you would describe it? Like they wouldn't describe themselves in terms of who they are as a, um, as a in person terms of their work. Um, uh, I think, I think it varies. I mean, I think I've mm-hmm. had a, a unique journey. So I've lived in a lot of places and been to a lot of places. Um, and so I would say like the infusion of different cultures and different backgrounds have like seeped into my, my being. And so that's a part of my getting to know me too, right. As a human being, like I've lived in Nigeria twice. I've lived in Brazil and Venezuela and China. Um, and so like having those experience and, and can you imagine I have, I have friends who are Asian. They were born in Chicago and other parts of the U.S. And I can speak Chinese better than them. So you can imagine the shock and awe of <laughs> someone in China uh, having me order Chinese food for my Asian appearing uh, Chinese friends. And so there's a lot of like things in life that make you much more complicated than just what you see on paper. So, so yeah, I would say like it depends. I think it depends to answer your question. Awesome. And then if, if you're not going to describe yourself in terms of who you are in terms of your work, so what mm-hmm. other things can you like use to describe yourself? Mm, I think I'm a person who loves art. I love my family, mm-hmm. I love my friends. Um, I love like exploring amazing new places. Like if you think about who you are or who you were, like when you were very little and what you wanted to be when you grew up, like who were, who were you? What did you want to be when you were like five years old? Like, even if you didn't end up wanting to be a doctor, engineer, whatever it was, you know, there's elements to all of us that are important to like remind us of who we are as human beings. And so like, if I'm going to like ascribe myself to somebody, like there's a lot more important elements, you know, related to my family, my friends, what I like to eat, what I like to watch on TV, um, going to see Dr. Strange last weekend, drinking whiskey, all the things that that are important to life um, um, beyond my career. My career is important too, and I'm very proud of the hard work that I've done to my career. But, you know, I think it's important to, like, make sure that we blend both elements because both elements matter. Um, I went to this, uh, this, this uh, course at Harvard, University where it talked about how there is no separation between your personal life as well as your professional life, and they they need to be very much integrated. And so, um, I'm a big believer in that as well. Like who you are as a person and who you are professionally are all an uh, integrated piece and puzzle of who you are as a as a human being. And so, me leading with uh, saying that I'm an HR, whatever, whatever. Um, would be somewhat deceptive because that's not only what I do and that's not only who mm. I am. 
Um, so just like you have a Metallica t-shirt on, I'm sure you're much more than your strong hairline and Metallica t-shirt. <laughs> that's well, that's a big part of who I am too. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you said, like, it's one of these things that I've always think about uh, because I've been listening to rock and heavy metal and specifically for Metallica for like mm -hmm. so long, for 25 years, that it became yeah, exactly. a part of me. Right. Um, but then when I, when I sort of reflect on it, like there were all these times when I thought like, how cool would it be if I can work in a place that could yeah. make me wear this Metallica t-shirt at the workplace? All day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and just you know, say, hey, this is me. I, it, it's you know, it's not the whole picture that I am an HR professional. It's not the whole picture exactly. that I listen to rock. Uh, but how could I do that? And until now, I haven't worked in anywhere where they would allow me to wear Metallica t-shirts. Well, which is a pity. my company would, and there's other companies that would do it too, that will allow you to to be your your authentic self, which I think is important. Yeah, yeah. I think this is why there's this big appeal uh, for a lot of the tech companies, especially here in the Bay Area and, and the tech companies, um, where they they do let you be yourself as much as you want. So of course, you know, as you know, there is there is a payback that they are expecting from you. Um, but I think it's fascinating. Like for if you think of other companies that you've worked with, or I, for example, where I've worked before, <laughs> tell you a really cool story. Uh, it was always really uh, buttoned up, and and you have to go in a suit or a shirt, mm -hmm. a buttoned up shirt and and tie and all of that. And you know, you come here to the Bay Area, work for the tech companies where the national dress is the hoodie. How how cool is that? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I was working with my first project that I've had with one of these big tech companies here when I first moved to um, to the Bay Area. Uh, and I was working with, you know, one of the fangs uh, uh, on a project. And I didn't mm -hmm. understand at that time. It was my first month, my first uh, project. I went there and I just came from like doing consulting and then moving to working in a, in a bank. So both of them were mm -hmm. really formal. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what? It's going to be the same. You have to show up formal. What you wear mm -hmm. is part of, you know, the work mm -hmm. that you do and all of that. And I go to this meeting in the morning. Everybody's just... Uh, we planned the meeting. Hey, we're going to see you there. Send the location and everything. But there was no dress code. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put my suit on and go to this meeting. Um, and I took the tie with me. I said, let me wear the tie too. And they said, no, maybe it's not a tie. Let me put it. And I mm. go to this meeting and I was the only one in that meeting who was wearing a suit. Everybody else is in their denim or yeah. their t-shirts and hoodies and, uh, and trainers, which is, which is amazing. Yeah, I remember those days. That was cool. All right, so um, so let's go back to um, to work. But but also, like you've you've said, um, you've started and you've worked in HR for uh, all it's of your life. 20, and you've... Yeah, about twenty years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and so, uh, working in HR, you didn't work only in the US. So you're currently in the Bay Area. Um, and you've worked in Nigeria, China, as you said, Brazil, Venezuela, um, Venezuela, Houston, Houston, Texas was like a foreign country as well. I'm not from Houston, Texas. <laughs> Houston, Texas was a foreign country. It was. It was like a foreign country. I wasn't ready for the rodeo. I wasn't ready to ride horses and mutton busting. So yes, I would say like. China compared to Houston. Houston was a more cultural shock for me than it was uh, anything. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm 6'4", and I'm black, obviously. So living in China actually felt more at home than it did in Houston, Texas, with the mutton busting and the rodeo. <laughs> but how's that? Like, is China that... Where, where did you live in China? I lived in Beijing. I lived in Beijing for three okay. and a half years. Cool. And, and Beijing is, um, from what I hear, is also a cosmopolitan uh, city, Super so cosmopolitan. a lot of different... Mm. Absolutely. No, it's an amazing city. So if anybody mm -hmm. has, has never been, I would highly encourage you once it reopens after COVID. Mm -hmm. Seeing the Great Wall is incredible. Cool. And so from all these places that you've lived in, definitely you've seen what work is like in all these places. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I used to run... I used to run uh, human resources for, for, for China overall. 
So yeah, mm-hmm. I've seen all the all the good and the bad of the different countries for sure. And so, what have you seen from living in all these uh, countries? Um, what did that teach you about the nature of work? Like, what does it mean? Are, are there places that work harder than other places? Um, and I'll, let me ask you. Uh, let me tell you why I, I, I am asking this question. Um, mm-hmm. Because for a lot of people who come to the U.S., they feel that coming to the U.S. means that there is a lot of hard work. Uh, mm-hmm. And and you know I I've sensed it too. When I came here, work mm-hmm. here is at a different level compared to where I was before in Dubai. Uh, mm-hmm. So there is that focus on results. There is that focus on hard uh, doing doing uh, a job really good. There is that focus on uh, a lot of the time on working really long hours. Uh, which I think is is you know justified. You 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 want to compete and you want to prove yourself, so you have to put all you have at work. Um, mm-hmm. And although this has been changing a lot recently, mm-hmm. um, but my question is: Do you feel that like work here in the U.S. is similar to other countries when it comes to the focus on work and and the hard work? Uh, do you feel it's something different? Do you feel other countries work harder than here? Yeah, I would say like, you know, I've, I've worked a lot of places and been a lot of places. I've been to, I, I would say like 83 or 84 countries um, across mm. the world. And I've worked in most of them. And, you know, honestly, everybody across the earth I found actually works pretty hard. Um, mm-hmm. It's expressed differently, but they, they actually work hard. But I would say what's, what's different in the U.S., is how people in the U.S. build relationships, mm-hmm. and how people in the U.S. Um, see results, and how they receive results. You know, because it's one thing to put things out there, and it's another thing of what people are actually going to receive that you're doing, right? And so, you know, there's even been studies that show, you know, like particularly people from overseas, you know, and, and again, this is a very U.S.-centric kind of model, but there's this element of like, I'm going to work hard and people are going to see my results and they're going to see how hard I'm working and I'm going to be recognized for it. Mm. Whereas in the U.S., um, that's not always the case. So there's an element of marketing involved. Um, Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that there's certain people that are really good at marketing. So I would say it's a combination of not only working hard, but it's also like communicating effectively what you're working mm-hmm. on and ensuring that you're working on things that people will actually remember. And and what I mean by that is like, there's a lot of things going on all the time with everyone, especially, you know, if you're dealing with a fast paced business, a lot of executives. So there's only things that honestly, people will actually remember like, it's just human nature. People only remember certain things. And so, like, focusing in on delivering and communicating really high-impact results actually makes a much bigger difference than, I would say, just saying, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to grind and work long hours. Um, That only goes so far, especially in Mm -hmm. in an American context. I would say, like, delivering superior results, of course, uh, but also communicating it and not being afraid to say, hey, I worked on this and this and this and this. And to ensure that these are things that actually people care about and people remember, um, and people can can attest to your 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 abilities and your effort. So there's a little bit of um, strategy involved, I would say. That's a little bit different than maybe some of the other countries that I've worked in, where I've noticed that if people work hard, there's a little bit of more recognition of like, oh, this person has worked hard. We're going to recognize them. In America, it's a little more glitz and glamour, even at work. Like, if you think about the Kardashians, if you think about, like, all the celebrities, if you think about what makes a difference, if you think about Donald Trump, and if you think about Obama and all the people that have a, a media force behind them, if you think about within the workplace, what is your what is your kind of presence? Like, what is your communication style? How are you going to communicate what you've been working on? How are you going to make pe- sure people know you know, what you've put into it, who you've talked to, the stakeholders you've interfaced with. So there's a bit of strategy there in terms of, like, how you show and demonstrate your your 
your value to the business and your value to the organization, I think is is important and important to understand. Um, the last thing I'll mention is also relationships. Relationships um, inside of, of all the companies in America are really, really important. Um, relationships inside of work and outside of work because mm-hmm. uh, because so many people work hard, people want to understand like who you are as a human being and the fact that I'm going to see you day in and day out. Do I want to work with you day in and day out? Do I want to go to happy hour with you? Do I want to see you every day? Do I want to see you at the water cooler every day or the coffee coffee spot every day? So there's a lot of relationship building that's a part of that um, as well. And so it's, it's, it's definitely a much more, I would say, culturally complex um, environment than, than it's just a binary, I'm going to work hard and prove myself type of uh Workplace. And again, this is my own opinion. Your own opinion. Um, and John, so so let's go back to the the so the communication relationship and marketing. Mm-hmm. And are these things that you've worked on specifically? Have you focused on like working on them and building them purposefully? Absolutely. Um, so, mm-hmm. for example, if you're in the workplace, what people know about you generally happens not only inside of work, but also outside of work. So many people, whether they're single or whether they're young or whether they're old or whether they have families or don't have families, they generally group themselves together by those little kind of pods and those little areas. Mm. And generally, oft, when, when you're outside of work, people generally gravitate towards people who are similar to themselves. It's just human nature. But at the same time, those conversations about fellow coworkers generally fall into like, I would say like a three minute or less snippet. So if mm. they're gonna talk about me, for example, I have to ask myself, what do I want people to talk about me mm. when I'm not there? And I generally am very specific about the level of information that I share because I actually want it to be the same. So mm. the le- same level of information that I share with the single fun 20 somethings or the older people with kids or the people who are the executives or anywhere in between is generally very, very intentional because I want people to be able to have the same messaging around me and my work as well as who I am as an individual, the things that I like to do. All those things are very intentional. Um, messages that I've created to ensure that things that work, people are saying the same things about me and they're saying the Mm -hmm. same controlled messages that I've intentionally ensured that people say. Because if you are saying different things to different people, then imagine those people are at a barbecue together and all of a sudden, oh, like, wait a minute, John said this to me and then John said this to me and they may be it may be something very innocuous, but that's not what you that's not that's not what you want people spending their time talking about you on. You want them to have synonymous messaging. Yes, John works hard. Yes, John is working on this. John is this person, this type of individual. He likes his all the all the key points should be the same no matter who you're talking to, especially at work. Especially mm-hmm. at work in the US, the points should be very very succinct, similar and very intentional across all types of people inside of the company. So yes, I'm very intentional about what I share personally, professionally, um, what I'm working on. People, everyone, no matter who they are, gets the same message. You could be the janitor or you could be the CEO. You're gonna hear the same messaging from me across Mm -hmm. all populations. And that's really, really important to create a synonymous messaging, no matter what happens, whether you're there or you're not. Okay, that's really uh, a good point. Uh, that's a very strong point um, that you have to keep consistent in the message, um, which I think uh, it's even more important when you're doing job interviews. You need to make sure <laughs> you deliver the same message to different people. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> they all talk to each other, so you don't you don't want Billy and you don't want Bob to have different different viewpoints about you and hear different things. You want Billy and Bob to yeah. say the same things. All right. And let's go back to then the the point about building relationships, because also a lot mm-hmm. of people, so 
a lot of people who come to the U.S. Um, maybe don't understand the importance of spending that time to build the relationship mm -hmm. purposefully and, mm -hmm. and outside of the usual working hours. So as you said, mm -hmm. there would be happy hours, there will be the mm -hmm. offsites, there will be all this mm -hmm. time that you're doing it outside. Mm -hmm. um, but also like, and again, this is my observation maybe, uh, the U.S. Is, is like the relationship building in the U.S. is very unique to other places. So you've been to Dubai and you've seen how people mm -hmm. build have, relationships yes. there. Yeah. Uh, or in the, in the Arab worlds in Turkey and yes. uh, in the Middle yeah, East. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, an element of building relationships based on, I want to say it's based on responsibility and duty. Mm -hmm. uh, and people have that relationship building as one of their main values. So we come mm -hmm. from, you know, large families, we come from clans mm -hmm. or kins until now. And so it's always who you know is very important. And that's not necessarily only related to the job that you're doing. So you always end up knowing a lot of people just, you know, mm -hmm. based on the nature of the uh, uh, society there. Mm -hmm. So, so, but, but what that means is that sometimes like, especially in the Middle East, there are some, you know, some, some things that you know, and you talk about and you ask about, which are here, it could be considered rude, but there it's normal. So how do, how do you do that here in the U S like, how do you build these relationships? during a happy hour or during uh, outside of the uh, regular working hours uh, mm -hmm. and at the same time not appear to be, you know, intrusive rude. or rude or. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I would say the, the first thing to remember is that most Americans have very low trust at work. They have mm. low trust with their coworkers and they have low trust with the company. And mm -hmm. many of them don't plan to be at their jobs a very long time. So mm -hmm. there's very low trust in general. So generally, people are looking to build relationships with people that they trust. Trust mm -hmm. is like the number one important thing um, above all else. And so part of the relationship building inside of the U.S. is, especially at work, is to say, and people are evaluating you based on whether they feel like you're trustworthy or not. Can you mm -hmm. keep their private thoughts private? Can you keep what they share about themselves private? Can you keep what they share about their families private? And so the relationships inside the U.S. are very much based on low trust. It's a really important thing to remember. Um, and a part of that from there is that people are also evaluating you based on your trustworthiness. But once people feel like you are trustworthy, then there's levels of trustworthiness, obviously, like when you become a friend, like then you become a deeper friend and a much deeper friend, and then people will share more and more and more with you. But people need to be able to spend time with you and understand who you are as a human being first, because there is this going in level of really low trust and people need mm -hmm. time to build that trust and relationship with you. So generally, that's really what you're what you need to focus on is like showing people you're trustworthy, showing people that they can confide in you without telling other people the same information and really just and on top of it, and this, this sounds really trivial, but people want to have fun. People want to laugh, mm -hmm. people want to have a good time, people don't want to always want to talk about work, people want to joke, people want to share memes on Instagram, people want to talk about funny things. And so the other important thing is don't just talk about work. Talk about fun mm. things. Talk about what you ate, what you're drinking, like crack jokes, have a good time. And they people want to build those personal relationships. But if you go into it with a very coworker, I'm gonna ask you a personal question and I don't know you that well, it's it's a very off putting thing inside of I would say inside of American culture. Like people wanna slowly build that trust with you and then they can they'll tell you everything. But you need to build that over time and you need to talk about fun things and have fun and talk about really light breezy type of things and talk about so talk about like food and music and all the fun interests you have and talk about your children and 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 everything but but yeah and the later things will come the more intimate things the more and and some of those things that i would say i've learned overseas is people are willing to ask more intimate questions quicker and I'll say in the U.S. people. Oh, you've are not... seen that too. Yeah. Oh, of course. People ask me. People ask me every detail of my personal life as I've lived overseas. 
So, John, tell me about why you're single. Tell me about <laughs> what's going on. When was your last they date? They tried to hook you up with a wife. <laughs> yes, I have a sister-in-law that you will find very cute. So, so yeah, all those things. And these are from coworkers. So all those things mm. are very, I understand the level of, like you said, the level of intimacy. Um, well, yeah. she's been in the U.S., that level of trust is very, very low. And so you have to earn that type of interaction in the U.S. Um, and you have to do it through, like, fun interactions and and being, you know, breezy and just talking about fun things. Um, and then over time, you can earn that trust and that level of intimacy. So it's it's almost like a different level of intimacy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a different way of connecting. Like I've I've noticed it, and I, yeah. I, I assume that I've offended a few people when I first came here, <laughs> uh, especially maybe in my first year in the U.S. I'm uh, sure, I'm sense. sure, yeah. And they t probably talked about you at a happy hour, and then you know, know they laughed about <laughs> you. And it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. I've, I've been talked about myself, so it's all good. Yeah. Cool. And then, uh, so it's, it's, it's good. You mentioned happy hour. I'd assume it's happy hour there. Now you're, you're in, in Miami in Florida. So it's now I am, six. Yeah. it's um, six fifteen. So I split my time between Miami and California, but, 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 but yes, the drinking culture in America is very strong. Right. So, so what does that mean? Like, and I've heard it before from people, um, oh, really? who, tell yeah, me more. I have a friend. I have a friend who has stopped drinking at some time. He wasn't American, actually. <clears throat> he was he was a Brit, um, mm -hmm. and he was telling me um, that he struggled when he stopped drinking. So he was saying that there is that special in the UK. Probably it's even stronger than here in the US. Mm -hmm. There is that strong drinking culture. So people mm -hmm. will bond around the drink. They'll you know have fun. They'll spill the beans to each other uh, yeah. around drinks and. Uh, and he was saying that when he stopped drinking, the, the his friends has changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of his friends, he noticed that were with him only because they were drinking and they were having, so it wasn't real friendship even. And mm -hmm. then a lot of his relationships has changed. So he made started making new friends. Um, he uh, and I can't remember if it was him or someone else who said that it even impacted a little bit um, how he was doing work and mm -hmm. and so here in the U.S. Happy hour is very important. Uh, drinking culture is very important. But what does that mean? So, so an interesting thing. So when I was living in China, um, the Chinese have this, actually the drinking culture in China is quite strong. Many people don't know that, but the drinking culture huh. in China is very strong. And in Chinese stronger culture, than, it's stronger, stronger than, than in Nigeria. US, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very hmm. strong. And so people don't know that like, even inside the Chinese context is viewed as you don't see the true person until you've, you've gotten drunk with them. And so oh. I don't, I don't <clears throat> think that in the U S is quite as strong, but there is an element of vulnerability that mm. people see related to alcohol. They might not say it as eloquently as I'm saying it, but, but I think that's the core of, of why, drinking is is so integrated is because it allows people to let down their guards and it allows people to um be more vulnerable and you're you're like both vulnerable inside of a space together especially if you mm. don't know each other very well you're not connected through any other means <laughs> and so there's elements of of like alcohol consumption that has vulnerability associated with it um, even inside of the work context that that people struggle with if you don't do it because they feel like they're exposing a part of themselves that you're not exposing. And that's why uh, people who are not drinking a lot of times makes other people who are drinking uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So so I, I, I can understand both sides. Like I can understand like not wanting to drink and wanting to be healthy or wanting to just be sober. But at the same time, people who are drinking oftentimes feel that they are being more vulnerable and being exposed. And so they don't want to be around someone else who doesn't feel as vulnerable and as exposed mm. as they do. And so I would say inside of the work context, it's the same. Like, 
coworkers who are dreaming together. Because again, if you go back to my original point about low trust, there is low trust. And so uh-huh. if there's low trust and you're deciding to go out and have drinks together as a bonding mechanism and you're not drinking and everyone else is drinking, particularly because everyone has different tolerances, different abilities to handle alcohol. And then if they're going to say something that they wouldn't normally say because they're under the influence or, you know, the variety of things that happen under the influence of alcohol, people, people feel very exposed. And so to have yeah. someone there who is not exposed makes people feel uncomfortable. And that's why there is a strong drinking culture in terms of like bonding, um, because people feel like it's a mechanism to create vulnerability and to create Mm. a bonding experience that you wouldn't otherwise be able to create over coffee or, you know, a a meal per se, because you, you are almost kind of taking a risk, quote unquote, of you don't know what's going to happen as a result of you drinking whatever alcohol. Um, yeah. Have. So like, so yeah, the drinking culture is strong as a means of bonding for sure. Like it, it, mm-hmm. it just it's the way it is. And so, what have you seen the people, or um, so if people wanted to build these relationships and they don't drink. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you, what have you seen that the, um, what are some of the things that people can do? Yeah. So what are some of the things that people can do if they don't drink so that they can still bond with people you yeah. know, here in the U S for example? For sure. And, and, and thank you for asking that question, because I, I do think that, that you can build strong relationships, even if you don't drink, but you mm-hmm. have to be very intentional about it. So mm-hmm. for example, you just bond on other aspects of connectivity. For example, if you play tennis or you love music or you play golf or there's some activity that you really like to do, you have to be much more intentional about inviting your coworkers or creating that connectivity in those non-alcoholic behavior, like your non-alcoholic activities to create that connectivity. Whereas like, Generally, to be honest with you, if you drink, if you drink, the opportunities become much more organically and easier. So mm. the invitations to happy hour, the invitations to dinner with drinks, or just drinks in general, will become much faster and easier and less intentional. So, like, if you do drink, you don't have to think about it. Like, people will be like, yeah. "Hey, you want to have drinks?" or "Hey, you know, have, have happy hour." Um, whereas, if you don't drink, you have to be much more intentional about creating those connection points with your coworkers and say, Hey, you play tennis, I play tennis. Let's go play a game of tennis together. Or, Hey, like you play golf or you play, or you love this type of music. Let's go see a concert together. Or let's go check this, this, this band out. Um, and so there's, there is a level of intentionality. I think that needs to happen in order to create those bonding mechanisms, whereas they may become a lot easier. Um, if you were drinking that, people don't have to try as hard. So I would say, mm-hmm. you know, if you do those things and I've seen that successful. Like I know a lot of people who ski together and do windsurfing mm-hmm. and all sorts of like, um, and, you know, outdoor activities together, but they have to be really intentional to, to look for those, those groups of people and to, to create those connection points and, mm-hmm. and also schedule it too, um, versus just go home and, and spend time with their family and not create those outside connections. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's very good to hear because I think there's, there are a lot of people, at least people I know, um, who would love to build, like especially people coming to the U.S., people who are, you know, in, in uh, other cosmopolitan um, cities uh, in Dubai and Saudi Arabia and, and Riyadh and, and, and Riyadh, well, you can't in Saudi Arabia, you can't drink, mm-hmm. uh, but like in, um, in Dubai, in Qatar. Um, there's sure. a lot of this cross-cultural mixing and a lot of this work where different nationalities and different uh, groups of people and different faiths and different interests come together. Um, and a lot of the time we don't work and and bond with people who are fully like us. Uh, so it's good to know yeah. that there is some leeway there um, on Absolutely. building these relationships. Yeah, for sure. You just need to be intentional about it. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, what do you want to talk about next? 
Well, can we talk about like why did something you decide... that I don't have to edit? Okay, yeah. So, 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 what made you decide to get married and have children? Oh, so for me personally, uh, that's maybe a good good thing to talk about for both of us um, because I know we have sort of different views on that. Um, mm-hmm. I think I've decided to get married and have children way early in my in my life. Um, it's mm-hmm. always, you know, the way that I that I knew. It's always something that I've wanted to do. Um, why? But I didn't. Why? Yeah. Um, like, was it was it something that was built in culturally, or was it in your heart? Did you have like a dream when you were a little kid to have a family? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> when you were like six. Did you dream of having other little I've always like, dreamt about being year, a father when I was six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you were six, did you dream about being a daddy? Like, and, and, and <laughs> well, it's funny. I think like a lot of because this is why why we condition people to and you know kids, um, but maybe women more. Uh, where we buy these all these dolls and teach yeah. women from yeah. The, did you did you comb your daughter's hair when you were um, when you were six? I, <laughs> I had, did I had dolls? I don't, I don't know why I remember like we had dolls, but no, I didn't have a dream when I was, um, when I was that young. I, so when did you develop the dream to be a, a husband like and a, a, a daddy? Like it's, there's definitely a big cultural thing in it and in, in our, in our culture. So the way that you make relationship, like if I'm talking about, um, Iraq or sort of more or less the Islamic culture or, or the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only one way that you can make a family and get with someone is through marriage. So partnering is out of marriage is not something that is accepted or something that is seen as people do. And although a lot of people will, you know, do relationships. So you would have a girlfriend, girls would have a boyfriend or, you know, all the other um, relationships as well. It's not necessarily just boy girl. Um, but um it's not something that you would see approved over the general society that, yeah, you go out and you find someone and even even like women and men, they don't want to just continue to date endlessly. Sure. They sure. usually want to have a family, have kids. Kids is a big part of it. And, yeah. and this is actually one of the differences that I've seen probably between men in my culture in Iraq and the Middle East and men here. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of I think more men in Iraq will have that readiness to become dads, will have that readiness to uh, form a family, will have that readiness to, like they want it. They love kids. They want to have kids. Mm-hmm. So my two brothers, um, both are married and both have kids and they just like, yeah. I think their kids is the most important thing for them. So you have that culture, like from a young age, yeah. you have that in you. Um, and I think she, so- for me personally, mm-hmm. I was just that. Do you Good. think that most men are are getting into these unions just because they want to have children? Do they actually like? Are they <clears throat> as committed and excited about the relationships as they are about the relationships with the kids? Uh, so again, what we're talking about here is you know without having a lot of numbers, um, I I think a lot of men there are ready to get in a marriage. They want to get married. They want to have kids. Uh, and they want to far, far, uh, form a family. They want to start a family, mm-hmm. and and um, and 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 you know, um, relationships between men and women there are still a little bit more traditional. So men are supposed yeah. to be the breadwinners, and and women are supposed to be raising the family and taking care of the kids. So sure, sure. Like if you think if the man is, although men lose a little bit, but they win also because <laughs> they got yeah. someone who. Uh, so so that's that's the thing there. Um, so I think that's what they, what a lot of men want to do. And then, you know, there's, now there's more, I, I hear and see the sentiment more of, especially that there is uh, much larger divorces mm-hmm. that they say, hey, I, I don't want to, um, be married. You know, I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to continue to be married or yeah. it's it's getting difficult and all of that, but it's still something very unusual because like the society doesn't allow you. Like you don't have I've you you'll never have hey, I'm going to see a family and my girlfriend is with me or a girl would go yeah. and hey dad, like it's it's very unusual at least in my Iraqi community. Mm-hmm. 
So I think it's it's all of that. But you're you're having a different philosophy. You wanna you're single. You wanna continue to be single. You're enjoying your singlehood. Uh, yeah. Why why is that? Well, well, I guess my first question for you is why not? Why 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 do you need to define yourself by by having a family or being single or not being single? Well, the other thing is, is here in the U.S. also, there is that pressure for you to, or a woman, uh, not the same pressure, I think, there, so there is more freedom about what you want to do here in the society, but there is that pressure yeah. around, yeah. you need to get married, you need to have a family, you need to have kids, and yeah. again, not the yeah, same I mean, pressure, because you can still be in relationships here without being married, right? You can, I mean, I, I would say... You can definitely be in relationships without being married any anywhere on the planet. I think it's just a matter of the social pressure you're gonna you're gonna deal with yeah. um, while doing it. Um, I think for me personally, um, you know, for for me, I've I've uh, kind of taken an assessment of like what's gonna make me happy um, and what's gonna bring me like joy. Um, and and being single for the moment is bringing me happiness and joy because I mean, for me, I, I would say I have tremendous respect for people who are in family units, people who have children, people who decide to get married. Like I told you yesterday, you've definitely gone from target to Louis Vuitton in terms of your, <laughs> your wife. There we go. Guys, 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 <laughs> like, Mohan, I, I think I'm gonna edit so upgraded. much that it's gonna be just like half an hour. Of... <laughs> My, guys, Mohana is upgraded substantially. <laughs> his his journey. I'm just but, gonna edit this episode no, so much that I'm it. I'm gonna no, end up with half an no, hour. You can't edit it. I didn't even. I didn't gonna do I it didn't again. Cuss this episode. I wasn't even being as reckless as I should be. Well, you weren't supposed to do a lot of things, but you're doing doing them anyway, so you might as well curse. I mean, I mean, like you upgraded <laughs> from Walmart, you upgraded from Walmart oh my God. to to Louis Vuitton. So my point is that you have to do what makes you happy, and so I'm going to do what makes me happy at any particular moment in time. But so what you got to reflect on is like. What's going to make you happy as an individual and a human being? And for me, having a woman in my bed, making my bed super hot because she's like 100 degrees and living in my house is not something that's going to make me happy. Mm. So I have to I have to make a decision around like what's going to make me happy. But more importantly, on a more serious note, yeah. Um, is at the end of the day, I think it's important to understand like what do you owe yourself as an individual human being on this earth? Most of us, besides the twins or the triplets of the world, were born into this world as individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain level of responsibility that we owe ourselves to understand us as human beings, as individuals, and what's going to make us happy healthy, feel emotionally secure and all the like super deep questions that you still need to ask yourself as human beings. And so for me, before I enter into a serious relationship, I want to do the necessary work to make sure that I am the type of man that I should be inside of that, mm. that relationship. And so um, I don't want to, and personally, I do not want to enter a relationship where I haven't done the necessary work to be the man that I want to be. And I don't need to be perfect. Obviously no one is ever perfect, but there's a level of like personal growth and responsibility. I think we all need to have and continue the journey on to grow and develop as human beings before we partner in that space, at least for me. Um, and so, so I'm, yes, I'm happy being single. Um, and I may not always be single, and life always changes, but for me, I'm happy to focus in on my personal growth and development. And mm -hmm. so, 
So yeah. And so, so, so that's great. And then uh, again, because there's a lot of you know being single is something that is uh, appreciated more now, and a lot of people are uh, living choosing to live their life uh, being single, mm-hmm. especially uh, in the West more than probably in the East. So how do you like like do you feel lonely sometimes for not being with someone? Do you feel like at times and say, you know, maybe it's worth having someone, although that I'll have these things that, although I'm not fully ready now, although I haven't grown as a, as the person who is getting ready for that relationship, because like a lot of people would say that, you know, being in a a relationship is a goal on its own. Like that could Mm -hmm. be the end of goals for them at a, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, at a, at a big stage of their lives. Mm-hmm. So if you're not being in a relationship or if you're not married or partnered or, mm-hmm. um, and we're not saying here that you're not partnered. I, I mean, you've been partnered at different uh, times of your life, but, but, but you know, he's just of- trying to make sure that let you know, I'm not a monk that I've actually uh, <laughs> had, a yeah. had, had a couple of booze. You had a couple of booze. Louis uh, had a couple of Louis Vuittons yourself. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. You you have a good Louis Vuitton. Maybe I've had a little Mark of but Louis Vuitton, you got Louis Vuitton. <laughs> but um, like, what do you do? How do you? How are you happy on your own without someone? Well, so first of thank you, thank you for asking the question. So, so first of all, I actually see um, being alone and being happy is actually one of the greatest challenges that most people are not willing to tackle because mm-hmm. it is, it, it is, in my opinion, one of the things that we as human beings um, need to deal with. Actually, it's the reason that when a lot of people get divorced, they struggle. Um, it's the reason that when people lose other people, they struggle is because I think having a really good sense of yourself as a human being is super important. And Mm -hmm. it's almost the equivalent of, you know, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first before you put it on someone else. Like they, you know, the, the analogy of the airplane. And so like taking the time to really understand Mm -hmm. yourself as a human being and understanding what makes you happy, um, what doesn't, who you are as a person, and, and making that a priority in terms of self growth, I think actually helps with the loneliness because when you truly do the work um, and truly take the time to understand yourself as a person, um, I think it not only helps your relationships, your marriages, but it also helps you, you know, if those things go away and those things don't always, you know, stay. Um, but if you've done the work to be a better individual and a better human being individually, it makes you a much, it creates a much stronger foundation for yourself. And so, you know, for me personally, I want to make sure that I have that strong foundation personally before I enter into, um, a serious relationship. And I think everybody in the ideal world should do the same thing. Um, because that way the person who you're entering into a relationship with is also getting a much better human being too, right? And they're getting a much better person, um, and, and, and vice versa. So, so yeah, for me, I think a part of the loneliness and all that stuff, it actually goes away once you actually Mm -hmm. do the work to figure out what's Mm -hmm. actually going on with yourself. But no one wants to do the work because it's kind of hard. It's kind of, it's not easy and pretty. Um, if you kind of dig deep and, and dig up all your shit and you dig up all the things that are going on with yourself, what happened to you as a kid? What did people say to you as a kid? What happened to you as a teenager? What, what pain did you experience at work? What pain did you experience in your religious community? What pain did you experience inside of your family? And like dealing mm. with the true shit of yourself as a human being and then making sure that you you're on a path of like continuous healing and then into a relationship you i i would i would actually challenge people who have actually done the work and tell me that they're still lonely because once you've done the work on yourself i think Mm -hmm. the loneliness will actually subside because Mm -hmm. you're so rooted in who you are as a person and so busy um 
creating a life for yourself that you truly deserve, it changes everything. So Mm -hmm. I sound like very Dr. Phil. uh, (laughs) Yeah. It It made me think about like, how is it that it all connect to pain? But it but, makes sense. But it's, but it's important, like having yeah. having having self healing and self awareness inside of a relationship or outside of a relationship is is something that's so important, um, and it will help you survive even the most crazy traumas because you know who you are as a human being. You've done the work. Mm-hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, what are the benefits? That's all I get. It sounds the... good, you guys. All I get is it sounds good from Muhammad. I want like a. It sounds great. A, I, I, thought, I, yeah, I, I want a Metallica. I, want, I feel like a Metallica riff is like. I, I feel <laughs> like you should, like deserve like a soundtrack. Like I feel like you should break out your guitar, Muhammad, and like. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was amazing. Like it was a, really great. It I was. I'm like so. A... It was so profound. I'm so. Um, what is the word? Um, I'm I'm bewitched by what you said. I, I don't know. It's the uh, uh, bedazzled. Is the word bedazzled? I, I, bedazzled. bedazzled. You know, so, for those who don't know, bedazzled. I was charmed. Was like this '80s, inf- inf- this '80s uh, <laughs> infomercial where you used to like stamp on like these jewels on these jeans, and so that's that's what bedazzled actually is rooted in. So, so what, what is bedazzled, it again? So, like in the '80s, maybe early, maybe late '80s, early '90s. Yes, I'm that old. There is this this actual product called uh-huh. the dazzle, and so oh. you would have like rhinestones that, that there's this machine that would press it onto your jeans, and it was called bedazzling your jeans, bedazzling your shirt, and so that's where the term came up. from, bedazzle. Just like bling bling came from cash money millionaires. Oh wow. I have to check this out. I can't find it bedazzling shirts. But there is also, how do you bedazzle a shirt? Oh yeah, I can mm. see now what it is. But there's also like there's um, that movie from the nineties, bedazzled. Um, that's true. That's true. You've seen that, right? The one with the uh, seven wishes, where. Oh yeah, yeah, I did see that. I did see that. Uh, where he and and do you know that there is an Arabic version of it? It's called. No, Pilot. no. Which is yeah, there is, it was uh, adapted into into Egyptian uh, cinema, which was a really fun one. That's exciting. Um, yeah, just exciting. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> well, so you didn't play the guitar, so I mean, I'm, not, <laughs> I, I'm gonna give you what you're giving me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go back to like being single. What are the, mm-hmm. some of the benefits that you have now that you lose for being uh, married? If you got married. That sounds so harsh that you lose. Mm. I mean, I mean, I mean I because there like is a lot of, of fun. Yeah, but there is a lot of benefits. Like I feel it now. So now I'm transitioning from being mm-hmm. uh, single to, you know, like, all right, let's go back to what are the benefits or what are you going to lose if you get married and not continue to be single? What are some of the benefits well, that a single man will all, have? Well, first of all, I do not plan to get married. Uh-huh. But I don't. I don't necessarily know if you 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 make it a. Cho- I don't think it's a choice. You lose something. I don't think about it that way, right? Like, of all my friends who are married, I have a lot of friends who are married. I'm a middle aged bachelor, um, and I respect their relationships. I think their relationships are are beautiful. So I don't necessarily think it's it's you're losing something. I would say you definitely are living a different lifestyle for sure. And I think like part of every man or every woman needs to decide is like, what aspects of your life do you find the most important? For me, Mm -hmm. there's things that there's a list of priorities or I would say core values in my life that I've created. And that doesn't Mm -hmm. just bleed over into my personal or life related to relationships, it relates to all aspects of my life. And so one of the, one of my primary core values is freedom, like mm. hands down. I work mm-hmm. to achieve freedom. I love freedom and freedom is one of my core values. Other people have different core values. It could be 
making family connections. It could be um, having children. It could be a multitude of things that are people's core values, right? So that's, I think people identifying core values is very really important. So for me, one of my core values is freedom. And so mm. having freedom and having, you know, children or having marriage, it, it could coincide, but the level of freedom that I want at this time in my life does not dictate that type of, that type of lifestyle. So mm. I want to randomly pick up and go to New York tomorrow. And then the next day I may randomly want to go to Turkey. And the next day I may randomly want to go to another country. And so, um, I want to have the level of freedom to literally do whatever I want and go wherever I want across the entire planet. Mm -hmm. Now, realistically, does that coincide with the responsibilities that come with having a child or having a really serious relationship? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Unless that person also shares those values and wants to create a really unique hybrid lifestyle that that none of us have dreamed of in order to create that. But for me, like freedom is and freedom is really, really important. And so I don't think of it as like you're losing something or gaining something. I think it's just a matter of like, what are your core values as a human being and what's important for you and, and how is your choices going to align with your core values? And again, I think that relates to work. I work for a company that allows me to do that too. Right? So I'm working for an employer that allows me to align with my core values of freedom. So I can mm. work and live wherever I want to work. And my employer allows me to do that because I've allow aligned all those things together to allow that to happen. Um, and, and it's important for me and I will make sacrifices because of that. I may not get the level of income that I would normally otherwise be able to demand if I decided to be in one place. But I go back to what is my core value is freedom. And so I'm much happier if I have that freedom, you know what I mean? And so I, I would frame it that way in terms of understanding what your core values are as a human being, how your relationships, your your employment, your family, everything kind of aligns with those values and make decisions based off that as well. Is there anything? So, so freedom is a big one. Is there anything else other than freedom that you think you'll lose? Or... Um, single people I mean, will have I, over married people. I mean, the only, I mean, of course we're probably, we, 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 we probably, uh, have much more flexibility, of course. I mean, mm. you know, that, that, I mean, of, of what I've observed from my other friends who have children, you know, there's a level of, uh, discipline and a mm. level of, um, uh, planning and a level of, um, structure that's required to maintain, you know, not yeah. only keeping your children alive, but also keeping your relationship going. Whereas if you're single, yeah. you know, I could be up till 4 a.m. today, wake up three hours later, work, take a nap, and still like keep my life going. Whereas if you mm. have those other things and those other people, um, you know, there's a level of support and planning that you have to account for that I don't have to account for it, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think the trade-off too is like, I don't ha always have somebody to go with to a black tie gala, um, but but you do. Um, I don't always have somebody to travel with, but you do. So there's always, there's always trade-offs, I think, depending on the kind of the circumstances, but also what you find important uh, for your life. Yeah. And it's funny, like, um, you know, they, they always talk about how, like you think of married people, I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe the stereotype that they, they build better relationships and they build um, relationships in a more. But actually, they found there was there was some uh, research and they found out that single people are the ones who get stronger in building relationships. Yeah, uh, Because course. what they do is they actually are, you know, they have to build these relationships. If they don't do it, they don't have people to, to be exactly. with them. They're, exactly. you know, keep on hanging Hello. out. They keep on yeah. talking and, and, yeah. and meeting people. So they, they do that a lot. Um, 
which is, you know, goes beyond only building, uh, just building a single relation, but then you build communities, uh, yeah. which is something I think is very, very important. So, mm -hmm. you know, who's your, your tribe and who's your community that you're, you're building. And mm -hmm. I feel like once you get married, as you said, with the kids and with the house and with the, with all the responsibilities and getting, you know, maybe a job or two to, to, to afford living, uh, wherever you're living in it's, there's a lot of time that you're spending on, you know, that you could be for spending sure. on, on building these relationships. Yeah, for sure. I mean, cool. I travel, I travel a lot. And, and one of the main reasons I travel is to maintain the relationships that I have. I have friends all over the planet, um, yeah. from Abu Dhabi to Vancouver, to London, to Houston, Texas. And so, yeah, a lot of the reasons that I travel is not, is to maintain those relationships, not to just frivolously go places, but to maintain those relationships. And I have the flexibility as a single person to maintain these kind of international um, cross-cultural friendships that many of my other friends can't, 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 can't have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's a, that's a good point too. Um, all right. So probably you've came to the end of this, um, episode. Thank you so much, John. Uh, there is one last part to the, to this, um, and I hope you don't just finish it in a hurry, but I do ask my guests usually to give two pieces of advice from mm -hmm. their being them. So from their life experiences, from their work, mm -hmm. from whatever they've done. So if you want to mm -hmm. think of it and concentrate it on two pieces of advice that you advise our viewers, mm -hmm. what can they do? Um, and so that's very general. <laughs> yeah. So I would say uh, the one piece of advice. So I read this really amazing book that I read all the time. Um, it's called The Four Agreements. Mm. Um, and it talks about the agreements that we've made in our lives as human beings. And so it's interesting. It was interesting premise because you don't think about the things that you think about or the things that are happening in your life as agreements. But they are agreements. If you think about me agreeing to be here and being mm -hmm. on this podcast was an agreement. Me agreeing to wear this shirt was an agreement I made to myself to wear this Adidas shirt. Um, and and I could have worn contacts, but I made an agreement with myself to not wear contacts and to wear glasses. Everything you do in your life is a decision and an agreement. And so I think learning to be intentional about the agreements and the decisions mm -hmm. that you make in your life are really important. And so I would encourage um, folks to read uh, the four agreements. Um, if you if you have time, it's, it's, I think it, it will help change um, how you think about things. Um, and the the last one I would say, which most people who know me wouldn't expect me to say this, um, but also develop your own relationship with God, Allah, mm. God, whoever you worship, um, having your own spiritual journey, irrespective of how you grew up and how you. Um, were raised in your own family, I think it's really important. So take the time to examine your own faith and your own spiritual journey and to, and personalize it and make sure that it's something that you personally are invested in and that you personally understand and you personally um, value versus something that was brought into you through osmosis, through family, through culture, and you personalize it to your own values um, and your own beliefs. And I'm going to add a third one because you didn't ask for a third one, but I'm going to add one anyway. Develop your Thank own you. values. Like, Very like generous. Said, like, like, you know, I try, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm going to make it rain here. So, uh, <laughs> so, so definitely like develop, like, what are your core values? As I mentioned earlier, one of my core values is freedom, but I took the time to like examine my own personal self to figure out like, what do I find important? And I make my decisions based on my core values. Because I know at the end of the day, even if it's something that I can make more money or I can do other mm. things, but I know my core value is this, it helps create a North Star or a really focus point around why I'm making the decisions that I'm making. Um, and like I said, as I mentioned, I could work probably other places and make more money other places. But because freedom is important to me, I'm working for a place that allows me to have the freedom that I want in my life. And so mm. I would encourage everybody to really focus in on the, on the things that they find valuable and, and really create a list and understand what that looks like. So you have clarity around 
your decision making and why you're making those decisions. So that's my, so like that's when, my two cents. When you're Thank you so much. When we were saying creating your your own values, you mean intentionally, so actually going through yeah, like what's an exercise or a way to think about them. Yeah, yeah, like even if you start a Google Doc or you just write it on, you know, a piece of paper, like why, what what are the core things you find important for your life? And, mm -hmm. and how are you going to censor your decisions around those things? Like, is it family? Is it freedom? Is it money? Is mm -hmm. it, what is it? that are the things that are the most important to you and are those things um that you've censored your life around and are all the things in your life really aligning to those values that you've created for yourself mm -hmm. if you say your value is family but you never get to see your family is your value really family well, mm -hmm. that's, that's the type of hard questions that creating values answers is like if you say your core value is spending time with your family or fostering a healthy family, but you never get to see them, then are you really aligning your decisions with your values? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. These were amazing two, three uh, advices. I really appreciate them, especially the last one uh, about creating the values. Um, really enjoyed this conversation, John. Again, don't know how much thank of you. it I'll leave and 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 how much i will edit. guys he's gonna edit uh, and everything and I, <laughs> <laughs> and I can't Ask wait until we hang again here <laughs> the best. <laughs> and i'll see you next